Hello, I'm again with Matthew Peterson. You told us about uh, the carbon market in the first lecture, and now you're going to tell us about why carbon markets raise such an important question of justice. We are very uh, curious what you have to say about this. Sure. So carbon markets have been widely criticized by activists. We have terms like climate fraud, carbon colonialism, subprime carbon, and similar terms have, have been coined to encapsulate the problems that these markets produced. Many of these involve important questions of justice, and I'll highlight four here. The first is about how we distribute allowances in an ETS. This is especially important at the international level. When emissions trading was first proposed as a design for an international treaty, as early as 1989 by a UK researcher called Michael Grubb, the proposal was that each country would get a certain number of allowances dependent on its population. This would mean that rich countries that emit lots and lots of carbon would have to buy allowances from poor countries in order to meet their obligations. And so you'd get substantial north-south transfers. So in principle, an ETS could be highly egalitarian. However, what's happened in practice, as in the Kyoto Protocol, and current negotiations, if they succeed, will in all likelihood repeat this, is that countries have allocations in proportion to their current emissions levels. This is known as grandfathering. So in effect, rich, high-emitting countries in Europe and North America have been able to turn the fact of their high emissions into a legal right to those high emissions, even if they have to decline over time. If there's an overall global carbon budget we need to stay within in order to avoid catastrophic climate change, then this means that developing countries are having their emissions rights squeezed by this process. Second, the notion of climate fraud suggests that in practice, carbon markets don't really reduce emissions in the way that we need to. In ETS markets, there is a recurrent problem of overallocation, where there are too many allowances in the system, meaning that companies don't have adequate incentives to reduce their emissions. Some co companies, notably electricity providers, such as E.ON, the German-based but Europe-wide electricity company, have made significant windfall profits from the European Union ETS. So they get free allocation of allowances, but have been able to pass on the costs of the carbon price to their customers. And offset markets are really reliant on the problem of the counterfactual baseline, the calculation of what emissions would have been if the project hadn't gone to head. These, of course, can't be measured directly, since the project did go ahead, and the project developer has a vested interest in overestimating the baseline emissions in order to maximise the number of credits they get awarded. Now, this is a problem for cli climate policy and whether we actually reduce emissions in the way we need to, but since climate change itself is a justice issue, if carbon markets don't reduce emissions, then they contribute to continuing all the injustices that climate change imposes on those particularly hard hit by climate impacts, sea level rise, droughts, floods, and so on. And of course, most of these people are in poor developing countries. The third problem is that even if carbon markets do reduce emissions in certain circumstances, they do so in ways that are in unjust. In effect, carbon offset markets can be seen as a way for the rich to avoid emissions reductions and impose them on in those in poor countries. These are likely to involve investments in projects which reduce emissions cheaply. Indeed, the, uh, this is what their tr aim is. But this means that when developing countries have to reduce their own emissions, as at some point they will have to, only the expensive reductions will be left. The accusation is that rich country actors are taking the low-hanging fruit, leaving the harder to get emissions reductions um, to the south in an unfair way. When you, for example, buy credits to offset your flight, in effect what you're saying is that it's more important for me to travel when and where I want and can pay for than to take direct responsibility for my own emissions. Someone else can be virtuous for me. Indeed, one commentator drew a direct parallel between carbon offsets and the market for indulgences in the Catholic Church in the Middle Ages. This was a market where the church sold the excess virtue of monks and priests to rich sinners in order that those rich sinners could get reduced time in purgatory. And the carbon offset market arguably works in a similar way. At the same time, even among developing countries, the investments associated with offsets go very disproportionately to the already rapidly developing. In the clean development mechanism in the UN, for example, the vast majority of the money goes to countries like China and India, and only a tiny proportion go to the least developed, poorest countries, uh, mostly in sub-Saharan Africa. 
The fourth problem, and perhaps the most insidious problem, is that offset projects that can be seen as generating new forms of control over people in the developing world. If you invest in a forest project in, say, Uganda, then you will want to know that the forest in fact grows, that local people don't cut it down for firewood, that it's managed well, and so on. If you can't do this, you won't get your carbon credits in the long term. And you'll need to do this, know this over a long period of time. Forest projects, for example, typically try to guarantee the carbon will be stored in the forest for 99 years. There are forests now which have GPS chips in them so that they can be remotely monitored. And there are plenty of examples in carbon offset markets of local communities being evicted from land they had, they had farmed to make way for an offset project in forestry or biomass. Hence the term carbon colonialism. So it's not only about the unfair distribution of rights to emissions, but it's also about the extension of control over land in the developing world by actors in the global north, just like in the colonial era. Activists who use the banner of climate justice are deeply opposed to carbon markets for these reasons and others. For them, these problems make carbon markets intolerable politically and means they must be resisted and opposed. But at the very least, even if you don't, you don't have that total re uh, rejection of them, they raise really important dilemmas in relation to carbon markets. Can they be made to be more fair, and if so, how? At the international level, we could think about going back to Michael Grubb's idea as to how emissions rights should be allocated. There have been various ideas about this over the years, including notions of contraction and convergence, which means that emissions should contract to meet climate goals such as a two degrees centigrade limit, and converge at a common per capita level over time to meet justice goals. A similar, more recent concept is that of greenhouse development rights, which specify minimum levels of emissions consistent with, with meeting human needs to generate emissions rights. These sorts of ideas could be the basis for allocating emissions rights that could then be tradable, perhaps creating more carbon markets that were more just. These proposals crop up periodically in the negotiations, although rich countries, predictably enough, resist them. We could also imagine ways to govern carbon markets to at least minimise the problems they produce. The climate justice movements that have campaigned against carbon markets have in fact already in practice contributed to governance initiatives that have curbed their worst problems. For example, in the CDM, the Clean Development Mechanism, it's actually extremely difficult to get forest projects um, approved um, and forest projects have some of the worst problems of climate fraud and carbon colonialism. And it's, this is difficult precisely because of NGO campaigns against the inclusion of forests when the rules for the CDM were being negotiated in the late 1990s. But perhaps these problems cannot be eliminated, even if they can be ameliorated with good political campaigning and, uh, and, and regulatory activity. If they can't, however, should carbon markets be abandoned? And this, to my mind, raises a, perhaps a more general question about climate politics. Transforming the world to take the fossil fuels out of the global economy is such a complex um, activity and aim that it's unlikely to be possible to pursue without all sorts of thorny dilemmas such as those we face in relation to carbon markets. There's no climate policy that doesn't produce some sorts of justice problems, arguably, because of the great complexity of de uh, involved in, in reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Mm -hmm.